Hello, everyone. My name is Don Self, and as you know, I've been a reimbursement consultant for almost four decades helping people. One of the ways we like to help people is by introducing folks to experts in er different areas that can help them. We have one of those experts today in the areas of cognitive testing and uh, other kinds of mental health testing. We have Scott Henderson with CNS Vital Signs. Uh, I'd like to hear from uh, Scott today. Scott, tell us a little bit about who you are. All right, thanks, Don, and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I am Scott Henderson. I am the uh, Director of Sales and Marketing for CNS Vital Signs, which is a uh, uh, a world-leading uh, computer-based cognitive assessment platform and company. So we've got clinics and patients on six continents, testing available in 60 languages. Uh, we've been around since 2006. So uh, we're in the world of computer-based cognitive testing, you know, modestly speaking, we're the real deal. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I've been working, by the <laughs> way, with um, uh, CNS Vital Science for about 11 years, and I've never had any of my clients be unhappy with you guys. i got to tell you, we really appreciate what you're doing for our clients and all the patients. Thank you. Likewise. Now, when we're talking about cognitive testing and cognitive issues, which patients should be uh, tested for cognitive issues? So um, that's a great question. Uh, the answer really, <laughs> pardon me, the answer really is um, any clinical condition that can impact a patient's cognition, um, potentially that cognition needs to be assessed measured, tracked over time. So, you know, conditions like uh, anything from ADHD to depression, uh, sleep issues have a significant issue on cognition. These are all things that are very common, uh, very prevalent in a primary care environment uh, that can impact cognition. And then you can, you can assess the impact using our tool um, to, to uh, you know, one make sure you know what's going on, make sure there are other things going on, track the progress of your therapies and those kinds of things. I would say probably the, the biggest uh, use or the biggest request category that we get though is in uh, the assessment of dementia or the potential uh, dementia uh, of an older patient, uh, again, typically in a primary care environment, although not limited to primary care. Um, and I think it's important to know, uh, kind of to your question, where computer-based cognitive testing fits in, specifically in the conversation around dementia, uh, where it fits in the continuum of care uh, versus some of the more uh, uh, traditional, I guess, uh, pen and paper assessments like the mini mental, uh, the MMSE that's called mini mental status exam, or the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, these are uh, uh, very widely used there. It's a, you know, you can go download the, uh, the, uh, the, the form off the internet and print it off. And you've got your, you've got your test there and, you know, someone goes through it with a patient and they fill out the questionnaire. <laughs> Those are, uh, they have their place. Uh, uh, Computer-based cognitive testing has its place. They're not the same place. Basically, the computer is going to be very helpful in the earlier stages of the illness uh, up to and including, I should say, maybe back to and including even you're not even sure what you're looking at. If it's, in fact, you know, some sort of early dementia or if you're just looking at someone who is older and there is a normal degradation in memory that occurs uh, with aging that has, that there's no pathology associated with it, right? So, it, you know, a, a computer-based cognitive assessment, a good one anyway, can tell the difference between normal age-related memory loss and a true cognitive impairment uh, and can actually even help sort of suss out some more detail after that. It's not going to be helpful in a patient who has sort of moderate to significant impairment, um, someone who, who's who's kind of too far gone to be able to participate in the assessment, it's not going to do, the computer is not going to do very well there. Uh, the, by the, by the same way that a pen and paper test cannot assess very early impairments because they're just too minute, 
a computer test is not going to do a good job assessing, uh, uh, assessing advanced impairments because the impairments are too large and the, and the patient can't participate. So when you get someone who can't score even a, like a 20 or a 21 uh, on a MOCA or an MMSC, those are scored the same way, 1 through 30, 26 and better is considered normal on both of those scales. If you get someone who can't get, you know, a 20, 21, maybe a 22 uh, on one of those pen and paper tests, they're not even going to likely be able to complete a computer-based cognitive assessment. It's just going to be too, too much for them. But you can do a MOCA at a patient with a patient like that and really have a good understanding of their cognition at that point. So it just fits Computers fit in a specific place in the continuum of care that's different than where a pen and paper assessment would uh, would fit. Okay. So it's kind of like back when I had my heart attack and they gave me Restoril. I couldn't beat my wife at a game of backgammon and just seemed like I wasn't thinking clearly. Would that be, if I went and told my doctor, hey, something's wrong, would that be a good time to have a test like this? That's exactly, that's a, that's a great example. So uh, I, I like to use uh, the example of the the 75 year old patient who comes in and says, "I couldn't find my car in the parking lot for 10 minutes yesterday. Do I have dementia?" You know, and you can't answer that question in a vacuum. You know, there's there's a lot that can impact memory. There are a lot of things that are cognitive impairments that can look like memory impairment, but they're really something else. But they just sort of mask that way. Um, in your example, there are there are pharmacological impacts on cognition. Um, so there's a whole lot to the question. I'm having some sort of issue, some sort of struggle, fill in the blank. Couldn't find my car in the parking lot. Can't beat my wife at backgammon, and, and everybody knows I'm better than she is. You know, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, when when you have that kind of question then, you know, by default, and in, 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 we can look, look, if you want, at some of the diagnostic criteria uh, uh, around uh, or, or the ICD-10 codes that provide medical necessity typically for these CPT codes that are used. But that, that scenario is always allowable uh, to okay. say, hey, you know, let's make sure. I know you're on this rest wheel. So th that can have a cognitive impact. But let's make sure. Let's let's take a look and see what's going on. Um, the uh, you'd be able to in that scenario. Now you can't give the assessment, and it says, "Oh, this is this is Restoril and not uh, dementia." What you can say is, "Well, you're having a cognitive, uh, you know, you're you're having a, a, a cognition issue. You know, maybe we need to find an alternative to Restoril." And then after the restoral is out of your system, you could go back, reassess, and confirm that it was in fact the the, the medicine that was uh, that was creating the issue, uh, because it'll resolve, and you can see okay. it in the report. So you bring up a point there about the diagnosis in ICD-10. Does Medicare limit which diagnosis is that they're going to pay for for uh, cognitive testing? So it's. It depends is the answer to that. And what it depends on is uh, the, the locality you're in and your Mac uh, and who's who's writing the check, basically. Uh, and so the majority of Macs, so like I'm in Florida, uh, so First Coast is our Mac here. They give you a very long list. Uh, Novitas is the same way. They're they're large and in 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 pretty common. I'm talking like 65, 70 pages of allowable diagnoses. Uh, and it's all the stuff you would think of, you know, someone's got a diagnosis of dementia, someone's got a diagnosis of, of substance abuse, someone's got a diagnosis of dementia, chronic pain, all, uh, uh, depression, I meant to say, or chronic pain, any of those normal things that you you know could impact cognition are going to be on that list. I mean, it's 70 pages long, so there's a lot of stuff on the list. But it also includes kind of, I think of them as light diagnoses. The 75-year-old who comes in and says, I, I couldn't find my car in the parking lot. You don't want to diagnose that guy with dementia just to get a test paid for, right? That's silly. No one's going to do that. And Medicare recognizes this. So they allow you, uh, they have diagnoses like our 
41.0, which is disorientation unspecified, or uh, which you could probably diagnose me with three times a day. Uh, you, they have uh, R41.89, which is uh, other signs and symptoms of cognition. And, and it's just sort of, a, you know, well, we're not sure what's going on, but there's something happening here and we need to find out. So they allow you to do that. These sort of light, non-permanent diagnoses are included in the list. That's what most of the MACs do. So the, when I'm talking with a, a clinic or a clinician in an area that is, you know, under one of those MACs, the, the, you have to make a qualifying diagnosis in order to build the CPT codes associated with this testing, but it's easy to do. So okay. it's a step you have to make, uh, but it's not a difficult step. What you don't want to do is use the cognitive assessment uh, as a screener because the CPT codes, as we'll talk about, will pay, you know, uh, 160, 170, maybe even up to 200 bucks. Uh, and so you can't just say, hey, you're Medicare age and you walk in the door. So let me give you this cognitive test as an excuse to build Medicare another $160. They won't like that. So you do have to have a qualifying diagnosis in most MACs, um, but it's easy to do. Now, there is one MAC in particular. It's Wisconsin Physicians and Surge Corporation, WPS. Uh, it's only one, but it's the biggest one. Every, you know, I, I think half the country or more is, is under WPS. They've actually recently changed their verbiage in their LCA or, or LCD or whatever it's called these days um, to say that there is no specific diagnosis that you need. Uh, in effect, they say, just kind of use your best judgment. Um, so I, I always recommend in clinics that are in a WPS area to go and get a list from First Coast or Novitas and kind of stick with that list. Uh, again, I think that the intent behind that is to say for Wisconsin, for WPS, is to say, hey, rather than give you 70 pages of diagnoses, we all know what kind of works and what qualifies. So just do that. But I think they still would, you know, cast a sideways glance if they thought someone was, you know, overusing the assessment. So we don't want to do that. Uh, I, so my recommendation is always go get somebody else's list and just sort of use that if you're in a WPS uh, region. The other thing to know about WPS, and I find this just weird, uh, although they did not call and ask my opinion. Uh, so uh, the in a WPS, uh, in, 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 in areas governed by WPS in terms of Medicare reimbursement, they have an exclusion for Alzheimer's disease. So if a patient has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, you cannot use the typical CPT codes, uh, 96138, 96139, and 96132, as opposed to 99483, because at 99483, you, you would use uh, for an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, but where everywhere else you could, even if you've diagnosed a patient with Alzheimer's, you could still use the, 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 the more straightforward CPT codes. You cannot in a WPS region. And it, it, what's weird about it is it's very specifically Alzheimer's disease. It's not dementias. It makes no, makes no qualms about someone with Lewy body dementia, for example, or, 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 you know, something like that. It just says Alzheimer's. So I don't know why, but again, they didn't ask my opinion and I wouldn't want to argue with them about it. So just be aware <laughs> you can't do that in a WPS area. Well, you, great. That, that's really good to know. Now, you also mentioned about Medicare, but what about younger people? Like I'm 66 on Medicare, uh, but what if I was 55 or 45 and I started questioning my own cognitive issues? Um, sure. Is it, is it ap applicable for those? Absolutely. Uh, typically what happens is this. So first off, the answer to your question is that commercial insurance tends to have very good uh, reimbursement uh, for these CPT codes. Um, secondly, also, as you mentioned, younger people tend to have different clinical scenarios. So, uh, and a lot of times a clinician will use a longer version of the assessment, or it's probably more correct to say that with an older patient, they typically use a shorter version of the assessment because we're trying to make it 
It's more narrowly focused clinically. Uh, and uh, because again, in an older patient, you kind of know what you're looking for. If we're talking about, uh, you know, is this, is this dementia or is it not? Uh, and also older patients sometimes have a little bit less uh, uh, tolerance for a longer computer test. So we make a shorter, more narrowly focused version for that older patient. For a younger patient, and there are a number of clinical scenarios where you would you would use uh, uh, a cognitive assessment uh, in a younger patient and be able to get paid for it by the commercial carriers. Um, we typically recommend uh, the longer version of the test because a lot of times either you need more clinical information or it's valuable for the disease state that we're that we're looking at. So. Uh, the, you know, the commonly what you're looking at in a primary care environment in a younger patient, you've got kind of the, the most likely suspects are going to be, uh, depression, uh, sleep issues, sometimes TBI, you know, concussion, that's almost called a no brainer. Uh, that's, a uh, 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 no pun intended. Uh, and, uh, and then probably the big one is ADHD. So, um, now our, normed values, our age-related norms in, at CNS Vital Signs go down to age eight. So there is pediatric application. Uh, there, there, uh, 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 there are pediatric applications that are appropriate uh, for the assessment. And a lot of times in a pediatric patient, you're talking about ADHD. But that's not what clinicians stay up at night worrying about. What they worry about is the 25-year-old guy who comes in a uh, 25 year old patient who comes in and says, Hey doc, I've got ADHD. I promise. I just need some Adderall. So that's the patient that worries uh, a primary care doctor. Um, well, lots of doctors, but you, you see it a lot in primary care uh, in, cause you don't know, you don't know if this patient, you know, uh, is, you know, legitimately ill or if this patient is just trying to score some pills to sell to his classmates um, you know, that kind of thing. So our assessment has utility, uh, not just in assessing the patient's cognition, but also in identifying that malingering, uh, drug seeking behavior. You can kind of see that in the report. It's something we teach clinicians to do. Um, or by the same token, you know, to think about it more positively, validate a legitimate clinical concern where a patient really does need the help and, you know, you administer the cognitive assessment and you go, this matches what you're saying. And, you know, and so, you know, here's, you know, an appropriate prescription or whatever the, the therapy is uh, for that patient. That's very good to know, uh, because a lot of times we have all ages of patients in, in most of our practices, which brings up another question. I've talked to a lot of providers over the last 11 years that I've been using CNS, and often they'll sit there and say, well, isn't cognitive testing more for the neurologist? Don, I'm family physician. And I've tried to explain to them why it's so important. But you tell us, what is there any kind of specific specialty that would be best for doing this kind of testing? That's an excellent question. And, and we hear that a lot, too. So um, the, here, the, the, I think there's a twofold answer to that. Uh, so clearly, neurologists have a use for cognitive testing, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists even uh, make up a, a significant portion of our customer base. But the truth is uh, twofold. One, a, a lot of primary care clinicians need to do cognitive testing because, A, the patients are there, they're in front of them. Uh, sometimes these patients need help sooner than, you know, than it takes to get in to see a specialist. So there can be a long wait time to get in to see a specialist. Um, a lot of times, honestly, I mean, so let's take ADHD or depression, for example. These are things that are, are typically well within the scope of what a primary care physician is comfortable treating. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time. They they really understand those disease states and the and the and the treatments for them. At least the first line, you know, basic treatment for your run of the mill depression ADHD scenario. Um, the but a lot of times, you know, if you want a cognitive test to sort of reinforce that diagnosis, or so in ADHD you want to reinforce the diagnosis. In depression, you want to track the therapeutic progress because 
usually a diagnosis of depression isn't much of a mystery, uh, but the recovery can be kind of fuzzy. You know, it could takes uh, an SSRI six or eight weeks to kick in uh, and the, the patient comes back in and, and, and says, you know, you say, how are, how are you doing? Are you doing better? And they go, eh, yeah, I guess, you know, and a cognitive assessment uh, that's precise enough can actually measure the improvement that patient has experienced. So one, you know, you're on the right track. Um, you know, if there needs to be, you know, tweaking, titration done, that kind of thing. Uh, also, it's very motivating to the patient because they can see the report themselves right there in living color and they can see the improvement from one iteration to the next. And a lot of times, if we're talking about depression, you know, th that's very empowering to the patient because they can see that they really are getting better and they just need to stay the course. These are not things happening at a neurologist's office. You know, uh, the, the, they're doing different, different stuff. This is squarely in the realm of primary care. Um, the other piece of that, sort of the second part of it, other than the, simply the appropriateness of it, is that the CPT codes are very clearly not prejudicial against uh, uh, any given um, specialty. The, 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 we call it the, the, the five, there are five credentials uh, that can typically build these codes. It's an MD, a DO, a nurse practitioner, a PA, and a PhD level psychologist uh, can also do these things. Well, that brings up another question. Now, a lot of times with providers, primary care may say, hey, I want to get this specific test, but I have to get a referral. I have to get preauthorization. Do you know if any of the insurance carriers require preauthorization on your kind of testing? Not typically, no. Um, certainly not Medicare. You know, the private payers or, you know, it's like herding cats. It's very difficult to 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 nail down exactly, you know, because not only are there a hundred different carriers, but each one of those has a thousand different plans and different contracts from provider to provider. Uh, so in the commercial world, you know, I, I check, make sure. Uh, but but it is rare. It is, in fact, I, I can't think of the last time someone told me they had to get a prior auth uh, for the cognitive testing. And Medicare, these are mandated CPT codes. Uh, so the commercial carriers tend to follow suit there, uh, and they don't squawk too much, uh, when you use them. Again, I would recommend too. sticking with the, with those qualifying diagnoses just to make sure you're, 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 you're telling a good story. You know what I mean? You want, you want to be able to back up what you're saying. Of course. Uh, yeah. Is, what does a typical office workflow look like? Do you just, while the patient's in the office, just go ahead and test them or what's the typical uh, look like. Yeah, that's a that's a great question too. The uh, um, I would say that the most common workflow, uh, uh, in the one we see that's sort of tried and true and successful, is this uh, because it's it's not <laughs> excuse me it's not a case where the patient just tests in the office. You know, the doctor says, "Hey, let's do this," and the patient sits down does the test, and and everything happens in one day. And the reason is because there can be a pretty significant workflow impact. Uh, to doing that because the testing can take, you know, the the um, the the dementia configuration, uh, the shorter version takes a patient about 15 or 20 minutes to do. The longer version that you'd use typically for a younger patient uh, is going to be, you know, 30 to 40 minutes uh, of testing time. Now, the the one, this is not performed by the physician or, or the, 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 the qualified healthcare professional is generally performed by someone on staff. And even that person on staff doesn't have to babysit the patient that entire 30 to 40 minutes. You don't have to sit in there and watch them hit the buttons. Uh, but instead, the um, uh, they do need to be sort of available for questions. They have to, obviously, they have to sit the patient down. They have to get them oriented to the computer, to tell them what's going on, kind of show them what ends up and, you know, that kind of thing. Then they, I generally coach the, the, the MAs. It's usually an MA who's doing this to, you know, then say, okay, Mr. Patient, I'm going to be, you know, at my desk out there. I'm going to close the door. So it's quiet. Cause they need a, they need a room, uh, someplace quiet. They can take the test. And then uh, the uh, you, you tell the patient, hey, I'm going to be out there at my desk. If you have a question, come get me. And so the, the MA can do other things, but 
they can't be like, for example, in a room with another patient, they have to be available. So there's a workflow impact there uh, that you typically practices are just simply more successful when they schedule that so that everybody knows what's going on. You can't just take half an hour out of an MA's day and say, hey, surprise, you can't do anything but sit at your desk and you weren't planning on it. That's where it kind of work. So what happens is this. Patient comes in, sees the physician uh, or the provider, I should say, and the provider recognizes the need for cognitive testing. And so they say, okay, when you leave here, uh, I want you to go schedule two things. Uh, you're going to schedule a cognitive test where you're going to come back and that's all you're going to do. You're going to take your cognitive test and leave. Then you're also going to schedule a follow-up office visit that will take place, obviously, after the cognitive test has been completed. And then the patient's going to come back. They're going to come back, take their cognitive test, leave, and they're going to come back after that, you know, a month later, or, you know, whenever, um, and do an office visit. And during the office visit, the provider is then going to go over the results of the cognitive test with them during the office visit. Because from a, from a coding point of view, uh, you are allowed to, to have it. You can bill an office visit at the same time that you bill the CPT code associated with interpreting the results, which is what you're going to bill when you come back. So that's the flow. Recognize the need in one appointment, then schedule the cognitive test at another visit. Again, you don't see the provider, just the MA to do the cognitive test and the patient leaves. Then a third visit where it's an office visit, uh, where you got to do your office visit stuff. Plus you go over the results of the cognitive assessment with the patient. Um, and in each one of those iterations, you're billing CPT codes. Okay. So uh, two things come to mind then on the workflow, you could have the patient come back in. Let's say the doctor takes off on Friday mornings or Friday afternoons, but the staff is there. They could be doing the testing on Friday afternoons uh, with the patient and use that time. Is that, would that work out? They, they, they can. So the, the typical CPT codes uh, that you use for the MA to test are general supervision codes. So the physician does not need to be in the building uh, when they do it. Okay. The, so the, you want to think of it. There are two billing events here. I keep referring to it. So let me make sure this is clear. There's a billing event when the, the test is administered to the patient. And again, this is typically done by an MA or someone like that. And then there's another billing event that covers the clinician's time to do three things, to interpret the results, to integrate the results uh, in with their other clinical observations, because the, the, the cognitive test is not diagnostic. There's no computer-based cognitive test that is diagnostic of anything. So the clinician is doing the diagnosis and the the reason the, the cognitive test is not diagnosis, not diagnostic is because you can't take that information in a vacuum. You have to, you know, match it up with everything else you know uh, about the patient. So Medicare calls that step integration, where you integrate all of your stuff together. So you got to interpret the results, integrate the results in with your other clinical observations. And then the third thing is you have to go over the results with the patient and or the caregiver in an interactive way. So typically that just means having a conversation with them. It can be done in conjunction with an office visit if you meet the office visit criteria. So I call it the three I's, interpret, integrate, and interactive communication. And when you do that, that's the second billing event, which is CPT code 96132. So could the test itself be done remotely with the patient? Or does the I mean, patient have to be in a doctor's office? Could they do it at home? that uh, they, they can, right? At least on our platform, we have the ability to do remote testing uh, where you uh, email the assessment of the patient. Ours is pretty slick because you just, it's all automated. You just put in the patient, you make your test selection, put in the patient's email address and our platform kind of takes care of the rest. It sends the email, it sends reminders uh, if they haven't taken it um, and it walks them through instruction. There's a video that they watch. It's very sort of slick for lack of a better term. Um, so it's very helpful uh, to do that. And from a reimbursement point of view, uh, you can you can still bill the relevant CPT codes as of right now anyway, uh, uh, even if you're sending it remotely. 
because uh, prior to the COVID uh, public health emergency, you could not do that. Then when COVID hit, you know, along with a bunch of other CPT codes, they said, hey, we'll allow these to be done telemedicine because people don't want to come into the office. Um, well, of course, the PHE is going to end in May. Uh, but Medicare actually came out at the end of 2022 and said, uh, you know, hey, uh, we're going to go ahead and pay for these CPT codes, uh, all of them, uh, at least through the end of 2024 when they're done telehealth. So you can, at least for right now, you can still build the CPT codes uh, if you send the test uh, remotely. That's good news. Something that we do at DSA is we teach a lot of providers how to do Medicare annual wellness visits. And there are certain bullets in the annual wellness visits. And one of those is to detect cognitive impairment. Uh, but they don't tell you how. Can we use right. the, this system for that? So um, that's a that's a fantastic question. And there's a lot of confusion around that. Uh, the short answer goes to the 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 um, LCAs that we were talking about and the diagnostic criteria that provide medical necessity, not diagnostic criteria, but the, 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 the diagnoses that will provide medical necessity. So the short answer is no, you can't use our test or any computer-based test where you're going to build those CPT codes um, in conjunction with an annual wellness visit in order to build Medicare an extra 160 bucks. Um, the that they would they would not be happy about that um but it's an pardon me it's an excellent opportunity to um so one of the things basically what medicare is saying in there is hey we want you to do a a quick you know assessment of of the patient's cognition to see if you need to do more stuff that's really what they're saying right because they're trying to catch you know, these disease states as early as possible. So um, if you, you could develop, uh, I mean, there are other things you can do. I don't recommend using the MOCA or the MMSE, for example, in that scenario, because they're not very good at picking up the early stuff. Honestly, the MOCA is not going to identify any dementia that you can't see with your own eyes, right? There won't be any surprises there. Um, the, uh, as a, and not to pick on the MOCA, cause again, it's, it's got its place, but early detection isn't it. it you know, the, and the MOCA is the one that's got, among other things, uh, it's got, the, it's got a picture of a lion, a camel and a, and a rhinoceros, I think. And, and the nurse is supposed to point to the rhinoceros and, or, or point to, and, and to hand to the patient and say, you know, which one of these is the rhinoceros. And, and, the, and the truth is, you know, if you wait till your patient can't tell the difference between a camel and a rhinoceros, you might have waited too long. Uh, so, uh, and again, not to pick on the MOCA, there's a place for it, but early detection isn't it. So what we see is a lot of clinics will use a MOCA or an MMSE because it's free, it's easy, everybody knows how to use it. Uh, actually, the MMSE, I think you have to pay for now. But um, the... The, the idea, though, is, is it's not a very, it doesn't really accomplish what Medicare is trying to get them to do. So what I really recommend is for a practice to develop, you know, and it's easy. If you look at the diagnostic criteria, for example, for for our um, 41.0, disorientation and specified, it's things like, you know, do you walk into a room sometimes and forget why you're there? Uh, do you, are you in a, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, you ever, you know, pull up at a red light and forget which way you're supposed to turn for a minute? Those kinds of things, those are the things we need to be asking, right? Uh, asking the patient and asking the caregiver, uh, because that's how we're going to see this. And if a patient sort of, if you develop a questionnaire like that, and the patient sort of flags on that, then it's you can then issue the appropriate diagnosis, because now you've got a good, valid reason to do so. Uh, and then you can then use a good computer-based cognitive test like CNS Vital Signs to really suss out and see what's going on, uh, anything from, you know, I think we might have an early case of dementia here to now nah, everything really looks fine. You know, you know, like I said, I'm 55 and I forget which way to turn to the light sometimes. That by itself doesn't mean anything ominous, uh, but 
you know, it, 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 as we get older, it's increasingly important to verify that. You know, and one of the things we're teaching at DSA to on the annual wellness visits is the providers have to have the patient complete a health risk assessment. So like one of the questions in there might be, my friends or family tell me that I'm forgetting things that they tell me or that I keep repeating the same stories I've told them before. Uh, my grandson tells me that about me a lot, by the way. <laughs> but I don't know if that's normal. And I hope it's normal. I've never heard you repeat a story, Don. So oh, well, good. That's good to hear that. <laughs> but if we had that in the annual wellness visit HRA, then that might spark the provider to say, okay, wow, we want to schedule this patient to come back in for a CNSVS test. And is that what you're saying? That's correct. Yeah. I think that's a perfect place for it is in that HRA. Uh, I mean, you have to, as you pointed out, you have to do some sort of cognitive assessment uh, for that. And they are not specific about what it is. Um, the, I just think it's important, kind of exactly what you're saying, to recognize what Medicare's goal is in that and to recognize that some of the, the most commonly used tools really don't fit the bill. The, the MOCA, the MMSC, the slums, uh, they just don't. They just don't accomplish what Medicare is trying to get done. Your suggested questions, those are perfect. Okay. So how does a medical provider, the doctor, nurse practitioner, PA, whoever, how do they get the results of the test? Uh, they're in the portal. They're, they're, uh, so it's a, it's a web-based application. Uh, so when you go in and administer the assessment to the patient, uh, as soon as the patient's done, I mean, instantly, the report's available. Um, now, you're not typically going to have the clinician, you know, immediately pull up that report and start interpreting it again because of workflow issues, but it is there uh, that quickly. So as soon as the patient's done, the report's available. So as soon as the clinician's ready to, to start interpreting and to pull up that report and look, it's, it's available for him or her um, at that moment. And all they have to do is go log in to the portal and well, so they can log. That's actually not normally what happens. They can log into their portal and get it. Typically, what happens is the MA is trained, which we again we do the we do the training to because the MA can get it when the patient leaves. The MA actually needs to pull up the report, look at it, make sure the results are valid, et cetera. There's some steps they do, but also in that step, they download it as a PDF and attach it to the patient's record and whatever the EMR you're using is. And that way, the clinician really isn't going into the portal. They're just going to the patient record and the EMR. It's the MA who does that step. Now, does the medical provider need to go take separate courses and CMEs on how to read these things? Are they very complicated? Uh, they're they're not they're not complicated. They are. Um, uh, it, we follow a a um, like a stoplight. Uh, sort of thing. Uh, we've got some colors uh, and like a stoplight, you know, kind of green is good and not green is not good. So at its basic level, it's super easy to just sort of look at a report and see whether a patient is impaired, which domains are impaired. Um, but obviously there's a lot of granularity. There's a lot of stuff you can unpack uh, from our reports. So we do the training. It's not a CME. We just do the training it's, it doesn't take uh, very long. Generally, our trainings last, you know, between 60 and 75 minutes, and we're training a bunch of stuff. We train interpretation uh, for the doctors. We train uh, uh, testing best practices for the MAs and sort of uh, portal navigation, uh, and we also train billing uh, uh, for the billers. Excellent. Can you show me? Do you have a report you might be able to show us? And kind sure, of, uh, absolutely. Give us some me, what it looks like. Yeah. So this is uh, a report um, of the sort of that that broader test that you would use um, for a younger patient. It's got seven subtests. We measure eleven cognitive domains, and then um, kind of as you can see here. Um, this is the domain section, if I can draw on my screen here. This is the domain section up here. These are the 11 cognitive domains plus the, let me use my mouse so it's not jumping around. Plus we do a thing called the neurocognition index, which gives you just sort of a single number to look at. 
But this is what I was talking about, you know, without any training at all. Uh, I mean, this is the domain section here and, you know, the scoring part. And you can just look at this and know that green is good and, you know, not green is not good. And so you can, with again, without any training, you can look at this report and instantly know this patient's got some issues. Uh, and then if with a little more granularity, you can look over here and actually see which cognitive domains are impaired and which ones aren't. And that's part of the training we do is the significance because different disease states will present with different patterns of impairment uh, that are suggestive. You know, one pattern is more going to be more suggestive, for example, of dementia. Uh, another pattern is going to be more suggestive of ADHD or depression or something like that. Uh, so we teach you to do that. Uh, and that that's the part that takes a little bit longer. But again, at its broadest brush strokes, you can you can just it just jumps out at you. The other thing I really like about the way we do our reports is, you know, we I, I mentioned it a second ago. With this report we're looking at, there are seven subtests, and the the subtests are used to calculate eleven cognitive domains. And we're looking at those eleven cognitive domains right here on the screen. But, uh, you know, it, as we say in the Army, it, it, it don't take no GED, right? If there's seven tests in 11 domains, the uh, it's not a direct correlation test and domain. The, the platform is gathering multiple data points from each one of the subtests, three or four, sometimes even five data points from each one of those subtests. It's got algorithms in place that process all of that data. And then it takes that data, compares it to a set of age-related norms, because we're not going to ask a 75-year-old to have the same memory as a 35-year-old. And then it creates a weighted domain score, which is what we see um, with, uh, with the colors. The colors are basically the patient's performance relative to his or her age-related peers like that. But what I love about our report is that we don't just give you the calculated domain scores. We also give you the raw data from the individual tests, and they're laid out in the same green, yellow, red format uh, as, the, uh, as the domains are, because there is a ton, ton, ton of clinical information uh, that you can, you can see down here. Um, one of them I'll show you, and I want to keep an eye on the time here, but um, just check this out. Um, this is my favorite example. Do I have time to do this, Don? Can I show you this? Yeah, you're good. No, this will be right on time. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So this is that that sort of dementia configuration here. And uh, and I should point out that all of my examples are real patients. These aren't these aren't things we created for the sake of showing people. These are real patients we've been been given permission to use, anonymize, and use their reports. And so if we look here at this patient. Um, you know, again, green is good. Not green is not good. This guy is, is, let me draw here. This guy is 74 years old. I actually don't know if he's a male, but I'm just going to make him male. Um, and he's all green, you know, everything's, everything's good. His memory is even dark green. That's fantastic. Right. Uh, so nothing to see here, Mr. Smith, go home, hug the grandkids. We'll see you next year. Right. Um, uh, except, and you knew there'd be an except. We give you both sets of data. And so if we look down here at the individual testing data, we see these little pops of color. Now, if everything was really good on Mr. Smith, this should also all be green, but it's not green. So it's not enough. So remember, there's tests, there's math, and there's domains. So what's happened here is that even though there's some there's some lower scores down here, it wasn't enough for the computer did its math to pull those domain scores out of the green. But it doesn't mean everything is hunky dory. Um, one of the things that's concerning is that one of these little pops of color, uh, and again, these don't indicate impairment, but they do kind of indicate cognitive abnormalities that beg more investigation, right? And one of those abnormalities is in his memory test. That's concerning because impairment in verbal memory is highly correlated with dementia. But also look at this. This is the continuous performance test. 
So what we do in a CPT is we give the patient a super simple task and we have them do it for a long period of time. Um, so what we do in ours is we show the patient a series of letters on the screen, individual capital letters one at a time. And if it's the letter B is in boy, they hit the space bar. And if it's any other letter in the alphabet, they just let it pass. They don't do anything. So it really couldn't be easier. But this goes on for five minutes. So first of all, it'll drive your ADHD people crazy. Uh, and we are, in fact, uh, measuring attention and we're measuring impulse control. But we're also measuring reaction time here. So a little peek behind the curtain in our five-minute CPT. There are a total of 200 stimuli in that test. 200 letters pop up on the screen. And of the 200, 40 of them are Bs. So you can see right here, this patient, all 40 times the B was presented. He hit the space bar when he was supposed to. Omission errors means that zero times out of 40, he let a B pass when he wasn't supposed to. So he, he got them all right there. Commission errors means that one time out of the remaining 160, one time he hit the space bar when he wasn't supposed to. Literally happens to almost everybody. It's not a big deal, not enough to pull him out of the green um, here. And if all we were doing was measuring whether or not this patient got the answers right or wrong, he'd have passed with flying colors. But we're not. We're measuring his reaction time too. And choice reaction time correct, that means how many... Uh, uh, how, on average, how many milliseconds? We're measuring to the millisecond. So on average, how many milliseconds did it take this patient to hit the space bar when he got the answer right? Uh, so these 40 times that he got it right, it took him an average of 606 milliseconds to do that. Now, here's the thing. It takes 300 milliseconds to blink your eye. So it took this patient an average of two full eye blinks to determine or to decide whether or not that letter was a B. And that put him in the first percentile, the lowest group compared to other people in their 70s. So we know that memory impairment is highly correlated with dementia, but we also know from the data that it's not the first place that it shows up. It shows up in cognitive slowing. Things get gummy up top. Now, there's no way to know just from one single report whether or not what we're looking at is a patient who is experiencing cognitive slowing due to early dementia or if he's just having a bad day. We don't know that just from one report. What we do know is that there's an abnormality that begs further investigation. So you could, for example, just simply repeat this assessment in three months or four months. And if this is some sort of transient thing that's happening, then this stuff will resolve and Mr. Smith will be fine and that'll be great. But if it doesn't resolve, if he really does have cognitive slowing due to early dementia, this won't get better. I mean, it might go orange instead of red, but it will not resolve. And that will, you know, tell us that there's something else. Again, it may not be enough to diagnose with dementia that, and you, there may be reasons you don't want to make that diagnosis, but a lot of the interventions, first of all, the interventions work better the earlier you find it, right, uh, for dementia. And a lot of the interventions are lifestyle uh, 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 changes like you would for type 2 diabetes. And this can be very motivating to the patient to see this. It'd be a lot like, you know, showing somebody, a, you know, a fasting uh, glucose of 125 and saying, if you don't straighten up and fly right, you're going to end up with diabetes, right? So this is, can be very, very motivating to the patient to say, hey, you need to start walking a mile a day. You need to drop 10 pounds, switch to a Mediterranean diet, take better care of yourself, or you're really going to struggle, you know, maybe much sooner than you would, would other need, otherwise need to. Uh, the other thing that I like to point out here is that this is a guy, if we come up here, this is a guy that nobody's worried about. He is sharp when you talk to him. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he can fully tell the difference between a rhinoceros and a camel, right? That's not his concern. And nobody's worried about that. So, you know, dementia is a slow moving insidious, you know, illness. And it starts very, very subtly. Uh, it starts with things you can't see with the naked eye. It doesn't matter how good a doctor you are. You don't see this impairment, Right. Maybe right. if you know somebody for a long period of time and you can say dad's really lost a step or that kind of thing, 
but just sitting in the office talking to him, this guy's fine. So you need an assessment with the ability to do this uh, if you're going to make those very early calls, which will allow you to make those very early interventions and have the biggest impact on your patient. So you really can make a difference in the patient's um by a result of these, there's certain things you can do that's going to make a, a difference with dementia. Uh, can you stop dementia? Can you keep it from happening? Uh, well, I mean, there's different schools of thought on that. Uh, right now, uh, uh, the, 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 the state of medicine would say no. Uh, but what you can do is you can slow it down. You can greatly slow it down. Uh, by taking various interventions, like I said, many of them are lifestyle oriented. So you need a cooperative patient. Uh, so you need a motivated patient. Um, and, uh, uh, in, in, you know, if you could, I mean, this guy's 74 that we're looking at, let's say that just nature taking its course with no intervention, he's three to five years away from really overt symptoms of dementia. If you take some early interventions and you delay the beginning of the, those overt symptoms by three to five years, right? Now, this guy could be three to five years, uh, uh, it would be six to 10 years, six to 10 years from overt symptoms. And then maybe another three to five years after that from really horrible symptoms. Guy's already 74, so not to be morbid about it, but... You know, if you give him enough of a delay, he may not have to worry about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and most people would take that. Most I would much would rather. Go. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I would rather just take me while I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At my age. So this test right here is not just for dementia, though. You were talking about ADHD. You're talking about like, what about bipolar? Uh, things like that. So, um Bipolar, bipolar is a difficult, you know, disease state. Uh, uh, to, it's just difficult all around. Um, there's utility in this report to detect cognitive impairment. That's really what we're doing, right? And there's a specific cognitive impairment profile you can look for um, uh, for depression. Uh, it's less specific for mania, which is the other side of bipolar disorder. Mania, oftentimes it looks a lot like ADHD, um, only it's, you know, it, it can be grandiose and it's, it's not ADHD, it's very different. But, you know, from a cognition point of view, it's gonna, they're going to be distractible, they're going to be impulsive, uh, et cetera, um, for that. So um, the, hmm, I, I don't have, uh, I certainly, on the primary care side, let's say it like that, I don't have uh, uh, any clinicians I know of who specifically use this for bipolar in general. It's more common to use it for depression. I think there's more utility there uh, for de for depression. Does that make sense? It does. Makes total sense. I have yeah. um, some clients who serve as the sports team for the high school or junior high uh, doctors. And so... Patients getting concussions or patients that, uh, with head injuries, uh, accident, auto accidents, this would be beneficial for them as well then. Oh, for sure. Uh, uh, concussion is, is a classic use uh, for this, uh, this kind of testing because you can really see uh, uh, the improvement over time. You, you don't typically use this to diagnose concussion because uh, that diagnosis is done, a lot of times it's done on the field. Uh, this is a, you know, a 30, 40 minute test sitting in front of a computer. You're probably not doing that. Um, but the, the, the way we see uh, concussion, this assessment used uh, in, in concussion is in concussion management. So as soon as the patient comes in, a lot of times they'll take it sort of, it's not quite a baseline, right? Because if you don't have a, a pre-injury uh, report, then you don't have a baseline. But a lot of times they'll take uh, a CNS vital signs uh, immediately upon uh, injury or as soon as practical, not immediately, but as soon as practical. And then you're working with that patient over a number of weeks. Um, and then you can, you can reassess uh, and you can, 
you can really see the improvement. You can see potential gaps in therapy. If something just seems to be lagging, you can see it because, you know, without this kind of assessment, what you have as a patient report where who's, you've got the guy saying, yeah, I guess I feel a little better. You know, I, I, I I'm mostly better. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, I don't know if something's still a little bit off Well, you can see what might be a little bit off in the report by the same token, especially some of these athletes, they're trying to minimize that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm better. I'm better now. You know, I'm ready to go. Put me, put me in the, in the game coach. Well, you, you, you can't, you can't fake good is, is one of our sayings here at CMS Vital Signs. And, uh, and if, if you're still showing impairment, you may not be ready to go back in the game or back to work, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. When you're talking about retesting the patients, that means with say our elderly patients, you'd recommend testing them on a regular basis once a year or something, or more often so that the doctor can see how the patients progressed or if they've stayed static. Um, yeah. So the, I mean, it's interesting. That's an interesting question uh, that, uh, that is posed frequently. And because again, from a CPT code point of view, you have to demonstrate medical necessity, uh, in order to do this, the, 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 the testing. So what the guideline is, is to do like in that older patient, that sort of, uh, top level, you know, questioning, uh, that you would do, for example, in an annual wellness visit, um, if you have a patient who, when you do it, let's say that you do that question, uh, based cognitive assessment, and then you realize, you know, Hey, maybe we should, you know, dive deeper here. And then you get a report like the one I was just showing that shows some cognitive abnormalities, maybe things, you know, did resolve at one point, but you just want to be sure you know, those are those are very justifiable reasons to 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 perform the assessment. So um, it, in terms of frequency, it really depends on the clinical situation uh, and what's driving that. So really, the codes allow you to do this testing anytime that you that you feel as a clinician that you would feel the need to do so if you if you just think you know i need to know what's going on here if something's changed document that need that's really all medicare says document the need tell us why you want to do it and then do it and it compares their score last time to this time oh yeah that's a that's a great point uh uh it'll track the same patient longitudinally forever for as long as you or testing that patient and you can, it'll do it domain by domain. Remember how I showed you the different domains we're tracking. It'll show you each domain and show each domain with its own graph. And then you were talking about the codes and reimbursement. What, what does this test right here cost? So uh, the cost per test is uh, $35 is kind of the base cost per assessment. Uh, and that includes, it doesn't matter how many subtests you use. So it doesn't cost more to do the seven test configuration versus the four test configuration. Uh, it's $35 or less. The way that works is the minimum purchase is a pack of 10 assessments. These are virtual, right? It's not like any kind of real thing. Um, but you buy 10 at a time for 350 bucks. Uh, or um, if you, you know, if a practice is doing larger volumes of testing and they buy more tests at a time, they do get an incremental uh, price break uh, based on the volume of it. But the assessments will never be more than $35. Uh, and that's against a reimbursement, like I said, of somewhere between 160 and 200 bucks, national average numbers. Uh, you know, uh, it may vary depending on locality, but it's about where they're going to be. Okay, so it's thirty five dollars for either the what you call it CNS VS test or the Cognitrax test or whatever. Right, the the dementia configuration uh, within it. Uh, we do have a platform called Cognitrax uh, that is um, only the dementia configuration uh, and only available for in office testing. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a remote testing capability. Uh, and it also only comes in two languages instead of 60. Now, those languages are English and Spanish, which are the two most common uh, languages. So for a practice that says, hey, I am only interested in assessing older patients uh, for dementia. I only want to do in-office testing. And there are plenty of practices. That's what they want to do. 
uh, and I only need English and Spanish for my languages. If those conditions are met, then Cognitrax is a great platform for those practices, uh, and it's less expensive. It doesn't do as much as CNS Vital Science. It's more, it's more narrow, uh, but it's also less expensive. Uh, so that's twenty five dollars for assessment. Okay. And you mentioned about the illnesses and injuries and stuff like that when we were talking here. Uh, tell me, is there anything else that you'd be basically trying to use this for as an automobile injuries and stuff like that? Were there other um, kind of injuries to the head or sure. whatever? Abs absolutely. Yeah. So uh, any kind of uh, any kind of head injury, uh, any kind of injury that because um, there's a cognitive impact for chronic pain. So a lot of times we'll see pain managers use our assessment, um, regardless of whether or not there's actually head trauma involved. Um, there's actually a pretty robust group of chiropractors who will use our assessment. Chiropractors can't build CPT codes uh, for, for, for this assessment uh, anyway, but there's still a ton of clinical utility for what they're trying to do uh, for that. So in, in a, a lot of times they're working in an, in an auto accident world. Uh, for that. So there's a lot of utility uh, there. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, and we were talking about, speaking of injury, we were talking about those uh, athletic injuries and the TBIs. Uh, we have a, uh, a free program for schools uh, from, you know, grade school all the way up through universities, uh, where we actually allow the school to give a free baseline, a free injury baseline uh, for every student athlete, uh, all they have to do is sign up. It's completely free. And that way there is, um, if there is an injury, if this, if, you know, heaven forbid, but it happens, a kid gets a concussion, um, on the athletic field, the, the treating clinician will then have a pre-injury baseline, uh, for those, uh, for that patient. And it makes treating that patient a lot easier, uh, because you can really see what it used to be like before the injury. So it's a free program for all schools. Um, it's called Concussion Vital Signs. Uh, it's under our, our under our umbrella, uh, but they sign up totally free, and it allows them to do a, uh, a, a baseline really every year that the student can come in in August, part of their two a day training or whatever that you know whatever their sport is, uh, and they can take a baseline for that year. And if they do get hurt, then their treating clinician is going to have a, a good point of reference. Fantastic. And that seems like something you're kind of passionate about. Oh, I'm very excited about that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice initiative. Um, uh, the company did. It's not my initiative, of course, uh, but it's a it's a very uh, it's just a great service. I'm real proud of, of, of how the company does that and a lot of other things, because we also work with, you know, veterans groups and the DOD and uh, that kind of thing uh, where we try to give back a little bit. Cool. So if someone wants to get uh, more information about all this, uh, can we give them a link? Uh, uh, on sure. This um, webinar? Absolutely. The simplest thing to do is to sign up for a free trial. Uh, so um, we'll post uh, down below uh, links to both, both CNS Vital Signs and Cognitrax. So again, CNS Vital Signs is what most people are going to want to use. Cognitrax is going to be for the practice that's only seeing older patients. They're only concerned with, is it dementia or is it not? Or are they tracking dementia if they know it? Uh, they only do in-person testing uh, and they only need two languages, um, uh, English and Spanish. If those conditions are met, then Cognitrax is the right platform for that practice. It's a little bit less expensive, a little bit easier to navigate uh, and that kind of thing. So we'll put those links regardless of which platform um, we give you some free assessments to to try it out and to do it yourself and and to to give it a shot. And we also do free training um, for you know for life. Really, you can always come back and get training whenever you need to. You get staff turnover. You just want a refresher. We always do that. So we'll put those links if 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 you don't mind. We'll put those links uh, down below this. Fantastic. And and by the way, if a provider tries this uh, and and takes a test themselves. Uh, do you do you promise not to put their scores on Facebook or something? <laughs> the, the The truth is that I think seventy five percent of uh, clinicians who take this because we make them take it because it's what it's the only it's the only prerequisite for the training is you have to take the assessment yourself. Uh, no, we do not put it on Facebook. Um, 
But uh, I would say 75% of providers uh, score impaired in attention. And I don't think it's because they're actually impaired. I think it's because uh, I think when they're taking the test, they've got, you know, they're taking their test on the computer. They got a CME in one ear. They're doing chart notes over here all at the same time, which is part of the reason we do it, because we want the clinicians to understand that this is a serious this is this is not a survey that asks how you're feeling today. This is a test that's measuring cognition with objective data points. And a lot of times they don't quite get that until they do it themselves. But oh, no, we don't put sense. it on social media, I promise. <laughs> well, it seemed to me like them taking the test would help them see what the patients are going to be going through and the validity of how much how helpful it could be. Well, is yes. there anything else you want to add, buddy? We appreciate everything you've done for us today and taking this time with us. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to to share what we're doing here. It's exciting. I feel really strongly about the importance of it. Uh, and I would just encourage people to reach out to you if they want more information, because you have access to me and you can set up a meeting um, and or just go ahead and click that that free trial. Uh, one of those two options for the free trial and uh, and we'll get you we'll get you going. Exactly. And, and we'll like said, you can try it without any risk. Exactly. We'll put sign up links in there. Uh, and that way folks can uh, get signed up or get uh, schedule additional time with us if they want to. We'll put some different links below for them to be able to access. Well, I sure do thank you, Scott. You've been a blessing to us today, man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And we're out. We paused for a couple of seconds <laughs> as, as you asked, Joe. Cool. That's perfect. Shall That's I start the recording? Yep.